I am completely okay with no one ever reading things I write. It just feels better to write them. Make art that only you understand. Write poems that only you will read. Sing songs only you will hear. Don't worry about it being relatable. Create things not for communication, but for catharsis. Because when your audience is just you, your art will be too. I don't know, I guess I write because like, I have a really hard time expressing myself when I'm just like speaking. I feel like writing it down gives me a chance to like actually like edit and re-edit my thoughts until I can actually get what I want to say on paper. Because like, you'll just be thinking about something or worrying about something for like a long time and it'll just like running through your head and then when you finally put it down on paper and it's just like there in a nice little paragraph, you're like, yes, that's exactly what I think. And then and it just feels like such a relief to actually like have it out there and be like, yep, that's what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, are there certain things that you usually write about? Like, feels. <laughs> yeah. Um, depends. <laughs> Depends, like what? What are feels? Like, what are feels? <laughs> describe feels. Uh, mm, like, <laughs> describe feels. I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. Feels okay, more in New York. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes, when I wake, all I feel is a profound, consuming sadness. My mind, body, and thoughts are crippled. The anguish refuses to leave or to give even a glimpse of hopes that it will. It tortures me, manipulates my thoughts, contorts my memories, and amplifies my fears. It toys with me, forcing me to trust that there will never be an escape. I am void of all happiness and bliss. The melancholy wants me to stay, to feed it more. It wants to suck all slivers of life out of me until all that is left is a pitiful excuse of a human life. Then it wants to claim that too. Sadness is an immensely powerful, compelling force. It takes your joy. It takes your ability to smile. It takes your will to live. I didn't really write it for other people to relate to it. I just wrote it for me. Like, it's kind of cool that it's actually something that like a lot of people can relate to. And like, I don't know, it's nice, it's like, oh, other people probably have these like crazy thoughts going on in their head that they want to express. No. But if other people can relate to it, then that's pretty cool. So, yeah, it's just cool that it can like kind of connect you with other people and like give you insight into their heads. Like, yeah, I don't know, like with you, I want to read your poetry. <laughs> like, what's going on inside your brain? I used to think these songs were cute about the pretty, pretty girl and this pretty picture of love. Now it's all getting pretty old. And all these pretty, pretty girls diminished to the color of their hair, the color of her eyes, the melody of my laugh, the curve of our ass. And she stops singing to the music. She stops dancing. She doesn't wonder about the songs her pretty little head could conjure, only how all her pretty little features would sound in someone else's song, how they would sound on some pretty, pretty boy's lips just write when like an idea comes to me I'll kind of mull it over and not really think about it as a poem just think about it as this like new way of looking at something I'll just be walking along the street and like have a thought and I'm like I should write about that <laughs> just kind of comes out of the blue or like you'll think of one line and you're like that's a great line like that's a great quote I should put that on a t-shirt and then you think about it some more and you're like that would make a good poem and then when you write it down you just realize you have more ideas along the same lines the anger wells up and seeps at once out of and deeper into me. It boils, scalds, and rages eternally. Anger is rash and terrifying in its capacity to control you completely, to exploit the darkness you thought you had buried, and to set free hideous thoughts you can't imagine you harbored. Anger stretches your capabilities. It harnesses your selfishness. But hold on to the outrage, give in to it, embrace the fury, and revel in it. Anger is your savior. It's always easier to hate and screech than it is to love and weep. I'd say like the feelings were like fairly consistent. Not that I, I don't like feel the emotions as strongly as I did back then, but like it also like brings back and I can remember like how I felt at the time.
time. So I guess before, like, it's not like I was unhappy for years and years and never wrote happy poetry. I just never, like, felt the need to capture it. <laughs> Sadness and, like, depression and anger are, like, really big emotions and, like, being able to, like, sum up into this tiny thing kind of makes them more, like, like, easier to deal with and, like, you know, <laughs> like, less intimidating in a way, <laughs> I think. But I think just when you, you feel like you have the perfect words to describe a moment or a feeling, then I write it down. found myself writing more upbeat stuff, um, just about, like, my friends and, yeah, just things about my life that I love. I don't want to forget what this moment feels like, this peace, this lightness. And yes, the world is spinning around us. Our pasts make us heavy and our futures make us scared, but right now we are light. And I take a mental picture of them, propping themselves up with pillows in my bed, laughing, their faces open and beaming, covering her giggling face with a book. I take it in and I hope to never forget this moment, this feeling. And I know that if I'm in this exact place in 20 years, I can consider myself blessed. And we're talking about face masks and watching turtle videos on YouTube and we're drinking pink boxed wine out of Christmas mugs and making that's what she said jokes. And we're talking about the patriarchy and how optimistic we are for the new government, the new gender equal cabinet, and how boys say they're feminists because they don't care if we shave our legs, yet they interrupt us and don't listen to us when we speak. So we learn to yell. And then they tell us that we're bossy. So we've learned not to bother. And we wonder if there were a fly on the wall in the small bedroom, would they listen then? And we're talking about boys, talking about how sexy our new PM is and how we're trying not to see it, but hot damn. And we're signing Maureen up for online dating and trying to describe her in four words, trying to rank her optimism on a scale from one to seven, her sensuality, her adventurousness, her aggressiveness. And none of us know the answers, hovering between and And we're talking about abortion and she's crying for the mothers and I'm crying for the babies and we're just crying because we know there's no right and wrong, there's only sadness. And we're talking about church and about the lull of sermons, the way they talk like they're trying to hypnotize rather than inform. Talking about the church and how we were raised to feel like dissent, doubt, debate means the world is crumbling around you, means the devil has you. And we're talking until four in the morning and then we're sleeping, wrapping ourselves around teddy bears, stealing each other's covers, and we'll wake in a few hours and go our separate ways to our coffee shops and our homes and our jobs. And we'll study because we have to, work long shifts to pay off our loans because we have to. But we'll carry that lightness around for a little while. It'll keep our feet walking and our eyelids from falling, the dread from creeping in. Yes, we'll carry that lightness around for a little while, just long enough to carry us over until it's Friday again. Poetry is whatever you want it to be. It's like, be who you want to be. A R B I E. I don't know what I'm saying. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? <laughs> I just want to say like really like corny things. <laughs> <laughs> Poetry is like bleeding your soul onto paper. <laughs> Those seemingly irrelevant memories that sometimes flash into my head seem so unnecessary, so unworthy of reminiscence. I can't help but wonder if those memories do have some disregarded importance or monumental impact that I didn't realize at the time. These simple instances shape our lives. How overwhelming to think of the if infinite different bearings life could have taken with one simple change, a different decision, perhaps one made without a second thought. The impact that every moment has on the outcome of our lives is incomprehensible. We are often plagued with burning curiosity as to why everything happens. Perhaps a mischievous part of our subconscious is teasing us. Maybe our minds display the answers openly, knowing very well we will misjudge them.